Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adad Chaverim, Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Cool Shul Jewish Cultural Community, and Atheist United Studios. Joey, growing up on the classic Universal Monster movies, I couldn't help but sympathize with the monster. And maybe that was the point. Coming from a studio founded by a German-Jewish immigre, Carl Limley, these movies, which often feature a misunderstood, marginalized, and otherized character chased by villagers wielding torches and pitchforks, always struck me as a pogrom allegory. The villagers were the real monsters, and the titular character, whether it was Frankenstein's monster or the Wolfman, who, by the way, was created by Kurt Siodmak, who fled Hitler's Germany, was the Jew. That is, the monster was me. Layer on to that the history of anti-Semitic imagery, portraying Jews as demons and devils and vampires, and none of this seems like a stretch. So what happens when the story's perspective changes and the monster becomes the overtly Jewish and relatable protagonist? Our guest today has answered this question with a brilliant new film. Today, we're thrilled to have Noah Sagan, who wrote, directed, co-produced, and stars in the 2022 movie Blood Relatives, which is now streaming on Shudder. Noah also has roles in Glass Onion, Knives Out, Star Wars The Last Jedi, Looper, Brick, and a bunch of other films. Noah Sagan, welcome to Amusing Jews. Thank you guys very much. I'm so uh, happy to, to be here. So um, when I realized that it was you who played Dode in Brick, um, I told Jonathan and Mike, I've been quoting that probably from the last, I don't know, nine or 10 years. Like every time somebody says anything to me about something being close or something being real close, you know, you have a scene where you're in a sewer and you're going, you know, you want to hear this information. It's, it's about somebody who's close to you. Real close, real close. So anyways, like, <laughs> I, that's me like getting that off my chest, but uh, really, really enamored to be meeting you in person, uh, meeting well, you on I, Zoom. I'm, uh, I'm honored because I don't think anybody has ever quoted that bit from the movie. You know, usually it's, you know, there's, you know, of course, coffee and pie, oh my, um, which was a quote before. It was in the movie, but uh, but there's uh, they, there's a lot of great quotes that, that are in that movie, and um, I'll take I'll take yours now as well. I'll take your your contribution to the to the book of uh, of notable brick quotes. Thank you. So so as Joey's alluding to, our audience probably knows you best as that guy from the Ryan Johnson movies, um, as was mentioned, Dode in Brick and Kid Blue in Looper. X-Wing pilot Stark in The Last Jedi, Trooper Wagner in Knives Out. Poster up there. Oh, sweet. We released a uh, Stark movie. Oh, wow. So we're all, we're waiting. Any any day now, we'll get that green one. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's fun. Um, Daryl, Glass Onion, I'm probably leaving some out, but I know that you and Ryan Johnson are good friends, longtime friends. I wonder if, if it gets a little bit tiresome to be pigeonholed in that way uh i think again you are that guy from the ryan johnson movies you know there's worse things to be i mean <laughs> you know i i uh I, listen i think you know a lot of people uh uh have formative friendships relationships that start when they're you know teenagers or in their early 20s you know often at school or it's a first job or something like that for many of us that we would Brick, you know, Brick was my first movie, and many of us who worked on Brick are still working together today. And so I think, you know, to to say, you know, well, that's your association. That's kind of the association that I want. That's kind of the association that I think we all want because we're getting to do this thing that, you know, everybody wants, which is, you know, basically have a high school reunion every couple of years. Um, and get back to doing what we do. And then in between, we still get to hang out. Like there's, there's, there's really not, um, uh, there's really not a downside to it so far. I will say that I'm 
quite envious of your character in um, Star Wars specifically, Stomeroni Stark. Stom Stomeroni Stark. Yeah. I mean, I, I noticed uh, recently, because I was just doing a little research, I found that you have a trading card, which must like be the most amazing thing in the world, right? It is surreal to have, you know, Topps does uh, this sort of ongoing series called The Living Set, where, you know, they regularly try to update their Star Wars cards. And uh, number 250 came up, and um, and it looks just like me. <laughs> and, uh, and it's this lovely, uh, amazing piece of artwork. And, you know, you better believe we have framed, of course. Uh, it, it's mind-blowing, you know. But, but, I mean, it 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 is just a constant reminder that, this was my Halloween costume when I was like eight years old. You know what I mean? Like it was, it's like this, this part of my existence that just gets to be a little kid, you know? And, and, and um, uh, uh, that, that, that's what it reminds me of. It just keeps reminding me of playing Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. The name Stomeroni Stark is pretty specific, pretty amusing. Is that like an inside joke or anything? It's, it's a, it's an unusual name. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll try to make it, I'll try to get it as, as, as tight as possible. So Stark um, is a name that you'll actually see throughout Liam's spells, and especially that spelling and reference to the family member of his, a beloved family member who's got this very cool name, Stark. Um, so, of course, you know, why not name name a character Stark? And then uh, Stomeroni came from... Uh, a conversation we we're having with Pablo Hidalgo, who is the uh, the master of story at Lucasfilm. So he is, I mean, he's he's almost literally the wizard behind the curtain. He's the guy who you call to go, how long would it take in the Falcon to get from here to here? Or, you know, did something happen 35 years ago in our comic book that might affect the thing I'm trying to do in my movie today? And this guy is uh, a lovely guy. He's a good friend of, of, of mine, of ours. Uh, as we say in the moth, he's a good friend of ours. Um, and, um, and, uh, and Pablo and I and a bunch of us were joking that uh, that I could be like Poe's screw up like cousin. And that's why I got blown up. Like I like, you know, all the trappings of like a cool X-Wing pilot. But like, uh, then he gets, you know, spoiler alert, I don't make it. Um, and so we thought, well, you know, maybe I call, you know, we came up with this whole backstory. I did joke about, you know, all we want to do is open up a pizza parlor together and we can call it. And, you know, and what, you know, and what's my, well, you know, his name is Poe. What's my name? Maybe my name is Stowe. And I think, you know, we kind of Poe and Stowe's pizza parlor. Well, what is, is Poe short for something? No, Poe is the name to Stowe short for something. Well, what if it's something? And then I think Pablo just came up with Stowe Maroney. And then made it canon when they published the Last Jedi Encyclopedia, um, and here I am, Silveroni Stark, a, a, a really uh, just classic Star Wars name. One of those names that either sounds like it's a character from Star Wars or an anchor on NPR. Any idea if there's going to be an action figure? No idea, but I mean, you know, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll definitely be on Jonathan's shelf if there is one, for oh, sure. It'll be on my shelf, too. It'll yeah. Be right there. It'll be on all our shelves. Honored. Sure. Honor. Is uh, Blood Relatives the first movie that you wrote completely like a feature film and directed as well? It's the, it's the first feature that uh, I directed. Um, it, I don't know, maybe it's the third that I, that I wrote. The first that was ever produced, right? Yeah, mm. I did writing. I, I had uh, written, co-written, and directed segment of an anthology film that Shudder uh, distributed uh, two years ago, but uh, that was nine minutes long, um, and it was uh, uh, a great experience, uh, and I, I had uh, a great relationship with the folks over at Shudder, um, and so when it was time to kind of, you know, try to try to make a, a feature, when I had a feature to make, I mean, that was, that was the spot. Yeah, super cool. And uh, the three of us, Mike and Joey and, and I, were remarking before you came on how really unique it must be to be the actor, the, the main character in your 
film that you're also writing and directing and trying to hold all of that at the same time. Any insights about your foray into Clint Eastwood territory? You know, Clint and I have so much in common, <laughs> uh, politically especially, yeah. as you can imagine. Um, I, I honestly, I mean, and 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 maybe controversial to say because obviously I, I probably don't agree with most of Clint's politics, but I am a huge fan of his movies um, and even the, the 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 recent films. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that he does wear so many hats and kind of is able to sort of put something together that. Um, is, you know, watchable, <laughs> that, 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 you know, that you're not so close to it. You're not, your view is not so myopic because of all the jobs that you have when you, you know, write, direct, act, produce, um, that, uh, that you sort of don't lose sight of making something that people actually do want to see. Um, and of course, Clint does that very well. You know, there, there's a lot of, a lot of filmmakers who, who, who are able to do uh, to do both. I mean, it was, it was definitely a challenge, um, to keep everything straight, but it, it also sort of felt like, you know, we, we had such a low budget and such a short schedule and we were hanging on this thread, trying to, you know, stick it through the eye of this needle that had COVID all over it as well. And, um, I just sort of kept doing stuff that I felt like would mean we didn't have to ask someone else to do it. So it was like, well, I guess I, I like I got back before I could play the guy, you know, if that'll make things easier or we can afford it and I know I'll show up on time. I heard script, so, you know, so it was, I mean, that was sort of the, the impetus for a lot of those choices was just really just trying to kind of um, uh, make it easy on the people who, who had real jobs. That's a kind of fun reorientation too. We were talking about, you know, you directing yourself and whether that was a hard thing to do, but it sounds like you might be your favorite actor as well, you know. Showing up on I am time. Not my, I am not my video because they, everybody showed up on time. That's the thing. Everybody showed up on time. We didn't have any of, uh, and and that's pretty rare. I mean, I've been doing this a long time, and all those sort of odd, you know, kind of sensational stories you hear about you know, difficult uh, talent uh, are pretty, few, you know, few and far between. I mean, really, you know, because of all the jobs that I was doing, it really sort of fell on on Vic Victoria Lawless, who plays Jane, my daughter, who is you know in as much the movie as i'm in it's really a two-hander it really sort of fell on her to sort of leave the department so to speak leave the acting department and kind of set the tone for not only working opposite one another and kind of you know me going like oh my god okay you know was that do we do all right you know or should we do it again you know she she really did become a sounding board, but also in terms of sort of helping the other actors, many of whom were working for one day or two days, people coming in and feeling comfortable and feeling, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, le le like they could hit the ground running. I mean, that, that was her. That was big. So in short, without giving up too much away about your new movie, Blood Relatives, just so I get the title in there, is about a loner vampire played by you whose lifestyle is thrown into disarray when a teenager played by the aforementioned Vic Morales shows up claiming to be your daughter. Your first line in the movie is Yiddish, and you throw in a number of Yiddish expressions throughout the film, sometimes even giving Yiddish lessons to rural Midwesterners you encounter. What inspired you to make a movie about a Yiddish vampire? What inspired me to make the movie was becoming a dad. You know, it, it, it's really about um, this relationship between uh, my character, who is a, a vampire, and his uh, daughter who he meets and sort of ends up on this road trip with, like, paper moon. Um, uh, and, you know, anybody out there who's trying to make a movie, just steal from really good movies, right? Like, you know, I just, I wanted to make paper moon. I wanted to make Raising Arizona. I wanted to make my favorite movies. Um, and, and so, uh, and I wanted to speak to the experience of sort of feeling as if, I was going through a major transition, which I was, you know, I, I have had this really fun day job for almost 20 years now being an actor and being, you know, traveling and staying up late and, you know, hanging out with all kinds of wild people and talented people and wild, talented people. And, um, you know, when, and I sort of went from 
being up at 2 a.m. closing down a bar to being up at 2 a.m. burping a baby. And that was lovely. Uh, it's also a wild transition that anybody who's had a kid kind of, you know, can relate to in some ways. I, I just sort of wanted to tell that story. Um, and kind of as I was doing that, I, uh, you know, I, 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 I took a even bigger step back from just, you know, what does this look like in a way that's not maybe just about me that could be about something fun like monsters vampires taken even further step back and of course you know i i, I started sort of looking at what the world is, is doing right now to, to uh to to each other uh but specifically you know i thought how can i speak to um some of the social issues that uh anyone who has ever felt like an other can relate to and in my case that that's through being jewish um so you know I'm, I'm 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 not black and i'm not gay and you know i i, I don't have uh, uh uh you know i don't have a lot of touchstones uh other than my judaism to sort of directly relate to what it is like to feel as an outsider um, I'm sure I could find some of it if you if you really want to unpack it. I'm sure we could get pretty. But basically, I mean, it's, it's you know, Jewishness is uh, obviously a, a sort of you know, it's it's if we're playing Family Feud, it's right up there. You know, it's a lot of other uh, 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 minority experiences. And so I thought, you know, that that maybe if I could speak about that from from my perspective, it could help connect with everyone who has. A perspective during the film you and your vampire daughter are showing eating raw meat and it looks really realistic so would you care to share what it was made of absolutely i would be happy to uh and so there is yes yeah you know uh our, you know we are um at times ethical vampires uh that as you can imagine part of the conflict of the movie or our our, our our ethics um and so there's definitely the question, and then we just answer it. You know, what happens if, if you try to subsist on on raw um, meat that it is not people? Um, and so we've got this sort of raw, I guess it'd be beef um, uh, uh, that we're eating, and we had a heck of a time trying to figure out how to make it. And it turned out um, that it was a specific kind of Korean sponge cake put through a meat grinder and then dressed with beet juice. And that achieved the mm. look and consistency that we were going for. That actually kind of sounds good. It was great. It was really tasty. It was really fun. I mean, it kind of made it feel like we we're doing what we were doing, which is just playing dress up. As we were watching the movie, um, I took a bunch of notes. I do that anyway, but uh, especially for you. So I'm just going to share some of my notes. And then this is all leading to a question as well. So um, I hope this is also spoiler free. And you could tell me later if uh, we need to cut any of this. The movie doesn't have a classic villain. The vampires are the good guy and gal, and the victims of the vampires all deserve it in one way or another. There's no unnecessary love interest. There's some excellent Klezmer-inspired scoring. It's very funny at times. The cast is refreshingly diverse. There's also, of course, this wonderful father-daughter theme that you were talking about. And it's basically a Holocaust or Holocaust-adjacent kind of trauma movie as well. Um, yet, the film's Jewishness is not forced. And I think anyone can relate to it, as you're saying, and appreciate it without needing to be Jewish or not needing to know Yiddish, even though I think that helps, if I'm being honest. So my question is this. Does your character's fear of losing his hair reflect your own fears about getting older and losing what is, I must say, a particularly beautiful head of hair. Well, I uh, I would like to thank the uh, the good people at I don't know what company makes 
uh, Propecia, but they have been very good to me uh, over the last few years. As uh, as you can see, I have nothing nothing to hide uh, because there is nobody in my family who has a stitch of hair on their head. And I thought, I didn't really, you know, I, I mean, you care, but you don't care. You know what I mean? Like, maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. But, uh, you know, many years ago, not many, uh, maybe eight years ago, I thought, well, you know, some somebody, uh, some friend of mine was taking this stuff and was like, oh, it's fine, it's great. It doesn't cost very much. And, um, uh, and so I thought, well, I'll try it. And I've been taking it ever since. I still have my hair, so maybe it still works. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, you know, at this point, I've got two kids. I'm going to be 40 soon. And I made my movie. I got nothing to prove. If I lose my hair, I lose my hair. You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> it's not reflective. It's not like, you know, oh, I need to like, you know, like take better care of my heart or all this other more important stuff. You know what I mean? That I think sort of happens as you mature where you think like, you know, oh man, yeah, I got to like, really get heart healthy because, you know, you got to you know, you get, got to get that colonoscopy when it's time guys you know like all the really sort of proactive like health stuff like yeah there's, there's a vanity there um but i thought you know the idea of, of of playing up on on this character's vanity as it kind of relates to you know him facing down fatherhood is absolutely stuff that i've thought of for sure yeah um you know which is particularly interesting perhaps because vampires supposedly can't see themselves in the mirror right that's a good point. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, I didn't. Think, I didn't think about that. Well, the question is, I actually, I don't. We can't see vampires in the mirror, but can? Yeah, right. Can he see and, himself in the mirror. Yeah, good point. This is this opens a whole interesting area. Although we we've had handsome vampires before in Lost Boys and and that kind of stuff, so there I must mean, be something to it. Yeah. yeah, and there's sort of this vanity thing, and then I think also if you want to dive a little deeper, I think you know the the. You, know, you do talk about it. There, there is this this uh, uh, part of the story where we talk about about the Holocaust and about surviving the Holocaust. And and my character is very much. Uh, I won't try to be. As, I won't try to be too specific. My character is very much stuck in a time and a place and a style that he thinks is representative of of something that makes him cool. Right. The idea of who you think you are. And what you think matters, right? Is it the thing that you wear every day? Is it your your hair? Is it the car you drive? I mean, you know, these are pretty like, you know, again, family feud style with a bullet survey says like that's the stuff that you think makes you who you are. Eh, nah. I really loved the uh, grayness of those Midwestern scenes. I mean, like I have no idea how you would shoot with that kind of lighting. Uh, it just really amazed me. Yeah, you talk about the uh, the day the day for night, the uh, the stuff that was supposed to be kind of uh, in the middle of the night, and then it becomes dawn when the kids are all together in that field. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just like it it kind of glowed. It was eerie. It was it. I I don't think I've ever seen it in a movie before, and it popped up a few times, and each time it kind of caught my breath. Oh well, well, thank you. Yeah, a lot of the there there are a lot of um, tools that people used to use for a movie like this um one of them is something i just mentioned called day for night which is basically you know when you shoot during the day away from the sun potentially when the sun is so high that there are no shadows and then you color it and tint it and darken it to try to seem like it's night but of course it doesn't quite look like night it looks like this other sort of liminal weird you know space and we kind of use that of course as a transition to the sun coming up for that portion another thing that we did that is sort of harkens back to the the old old days is this thing that used to happen called rear projection so before they did green screen for things like driving they would actually shoot a road and then they would have it projected from behind with a car on a stage doing this and you can do something like that today and we did that but you do it with a with an led screen with basically a gigantic computer screen but um uh, uh, you know, you, you can sort of do it in the spirit of, you know, Paper Moon or Taxi Driver, the big one is beautiful, rear projection driving sequences. You know? Very cool. Well, I'm going to continue to 
try to be spoiler free here. And I have like a theory. I'm probably wrong, but just let me uh, say my piece. And you can, this is like a yes or no if question. If it's like a brilliant deep dive Easter egg -y kind of thing, then you, you know, I'll just say yes, you were right. Good, good, good eye. That's good to know because here it is. Um, <laughs> so your character uh, listens to an audio cassette of Wagner opera throughout the film. Uh, this obviously isn't something that any Jewish person would do by choice. It almost feels like um, a burden that, that he must continue listening to this. So again, a yes or no question. My fan theory is that he is cursed to listen to Wagner in order to preserve his very existence or at least to avoid growing the paunch and losing the hair, as you say in, in the film. I don't know if I'm correct, but if you say yes, I'll be very happy. I mean, that's a brilliant, that's a brilliant fan theory. I can't, I mean, I, I could never take that from, <laughs> I could never, I would, I would I wouldn't be able to sleep at night if somebody came up with, uh, with this, this hashtag theory and, uh, <laughs> and I did, and I disproved it. Um, I don't know what the problem is with the guy listening to Wagner. Could you enlighten me? No, sorry. I'm trying to. <laughs> Sarcasm. I understand. There were a lot of his buddies that I would I would go and I would you know, show people the movie and they would say uh, you know they would they would be like you know um uh, uh, you know they would say how could you how could you include Wagner you know in 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 my in the movie and I would be like what what do you mean what about uh, what about that and you know um, uh, and for those who are listening who don't know you know generally I would say Wagner's probably you know he's probably the second most famous anti-Semite. Uh, and it's definitely up there. Well, Hitler's um, favorite composer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, it's real, real neck and neck there between the two of them. But here's the thing, guys. I am an enormous Wagner fan. I am a huge fan of Wagner. I'm specifically a huge fan of uh, of of what we use in the film, which is one of the operas from the Ring of Cycle. The Ring of Cycle is a suite of of, of operas that. Uh, are epic and, you know, are the sort of ur text for a lot of the fantasy and science fiction that we love today, you know, whether it's Lord of the Rings or whether it's Star Wars, you can see a lot of that in in the ring and it's quite beautiful. And at times uh, it is xenophobic and it is sexist and it is, uh, you know, a lot of bad things that were normalized in the 19th century. Um, you know, and, and, and so I do think that it needs to be contextualized. Um, I've seen the ring cycle and I've seen the ring cycle performed by the most progressive people on earth. And they did, and it made, they did a better job at it than I've listened to on the many recordings that they've done. So I, I do feel like there's a path to, um, appreciate that stuff, but obviously you know, I, 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 I thought to myself as I was writing it, as I was thinking about including it, um, you know, what if this was something that was your favorite music and then it got co-opted and turned into something that represented hatred for you? And how, how do you, how, how do you parse that out? Um, and so that sort of became the, the impetus for including that in the movie. Yeah, the complexity is, is beautiful. And again, the, the way that you are able in the film to kind of highlight these complex identities. Uh, I think all the, the good people in the movie are very interesting uh, background-wise, um, whether it's transgender or a racial minority or whatever it might be. I think the more we can appreciate the diversity within ourselves, the more we can appreciate it in others and sort of kind of embrace the complexity. I think, I think you're onto something with that. Well, that, thank you. And I, I think, you know, I, I was just trying to do what genre movies, specifically our movies have done for so long. You know, I, you know, you, you talked about it during introduction, um, you know, the, you know, not just, the founding of sort of uh, the 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 original studios by uh, uh, by Jews, 
a great book, Empire of Their Own, which is a great book about the founding of the studios by Jews who either were escaping uh, uh, Nazism and, and fascism or knew they were about to have to escape Nazism and fascism. A lot of people saw the writing on the walls and then invited their friends over, and that's how we ended up with, you know, Billy Wilder. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, specifically horror uh, having been something that was a uh, uh, often an allegory for otherness. And there's there's a great, another great book written by a, a friend of mine, a professor at the University of Pittsburgh named Adam Lowenstein, who literally wrote a book called Horror and Otherness, um, where he talks about sort of how um, uh, uh, through specific films, they can represent not just, again, sort of this, you know, again, sort of the hints, you know, anti-Semitism, racism, sexism, uh, ableism, but even classism, even religious persecution outside of Judaism, outside of Catholicism, sort of, you know, you know, more specific stuff. And, and, and it's all there. And, and a lot of people are doing it. I mean, Romero from Pittsburgh, George Romero, was constantly uh, asking himself, how are my stories socially relevant? Or, or how does my social uh, obligation reflect itself in my zombie movie? So always natural to ask <clears throat> do you have any other projects in the works oh thanks i i do uh i do i i have um i have uh a couple things that we're talking about you know we've been talking about trying to uh trying to to see if if there's a, a world out there where uh you know blood relatives can can become a series um, which uh, might be really, really fun in a, in a sort of father-daughter family monster verse kind of world. Um, and then, um, you know, I have a film that I'm, I'm hoping to get going before the end of the year that uh, I can't tell you much about, but I can tell you the people who are involved will not surprise anyone. No one will be surprised. Thank you so much, Noah, for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. Oh, I, I'm so, uh, so happy to be here. Very good to see you again, John. But nice to meet you, Joey. And my goodness, good to see you guys. All right. Yeah, and to our audience, now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe. Subscribe.